to the process of equipping students for success in photojournalism using action research in the photojournalism course, you've actually transformed the nature of the title into the question that Mikhail can embrace himself and his influence <coughs> in terms of his use of action research in equipping the students for success in photojournalism. Now, what I'm suggesting in those 36, I think it is, uh, presentations, only eight have got I, my, or we in the title, that you, you just practice over the next week or so. And I've done it with three in my keynote that you can access, just to see what it feels like to you to retain the I, to retain your I in terms of enhancing your influence in practice, in terms of your inquiry. <coughs> but knowing that you will have cultural and socio-political pressures of the research communities, the ethics communities, in your universities and also the journals, to remove the eye. And Deirdre, that was, a, you know, that was a lovely illustration of what I was saying as we were just talking yesterday. Because I was curious about why Deirdre's eye wasn't there. She said, well, I've been under pressure to take it out. Is the we. Yeah? Now, what I'd like to make sure is that those pressures that we're all under I really understood because in my keynote that's on the web, you'll see that every title for the World Congress in the Action and Learning Strand has gone back into the traditional form of propositional knowing. It's the traditional form of scholarship that you form titles in terms of abstract generalities. Like <coughs> it comes like all teachers, a particular course. And I think I'm hoping you'll resist that. I know sometimes you can't. Because the power of the committees is so strong. But remember this in terms of your academic freedom. But Jeff Sutherland Gladwell at Brock University, I mentioned this at the workshop on Wednesday, was faced with an ethics committee that said he couldn't do this research in the classroom with the children. And it was actually a self-study. So he was being refused permission to engage in a self-study of his own practice. Now Jeff was actually outraged, but he couldn't do anything about it because the university had refused him permission. But what he could do on the grounds of academic freedom was study the unethical behavior of the ethics committee in, in banning him from doing this research. Now, he had the courage to do this, and his master's dissertation went through. I put it on the web in the values section, and you can just uh, look at some of those pressures that I think you will be under to keep your own eye, or the we that you're working with, or my, within your title of your inquiry. Are we okay with this, just at the moment, that, that this is clear and you can get the evidence, you know, to show what I'm talking about? Now, before I go on, how long have I got? Could I just ask? Uh, another 15, uh, 18 minutes. <coughs> that's great, that's great. Now, is there anything else before I just go on to show you how I think every one of you... Yes? Okay. Um, I think uh, I'm hearing you, Jake, and I, I am one of those who didn't put I in my title. I think what I'm... For me, my response to you would be yes, not yes, but yes, and. Why wasn't there an I in my title? Was that for me, action research, if you move from the particular to the general as well, and I think that was, had a lot to do with Omar's point yesterday. Was it Omar? Yeah. About where does the theory come in? So for me, in my title was my conclusion, were my findings, and I tried to speak to as many academics as possible. So my title was there for one where um, I invite anyone in academia to actually think, oh, that, that's interesting. So the methodology doesn't necessarily have to come in the title. And there are, and there's another point, I think, is that uh, there's some very interesting recent articles in the Journal of Philosophy of Education about, and uh, that express a concern about some autobiographical research that is self-indulgent, that is sentimental. Yeah? So there, there, there are two things. And I don't necessarily want to go into that, but I think there is a, it's a caution there yeah. that we can stay too much with the eye. And following on from there, Deirdre's point about collaborative nature of inquiry. And I think a lot of academia is very individualistic, and I think it's also important to actually show that inquiries are, that you are never an I, you're always more than an I. 
And the last point I want to make is a fantastic article by Basil Anthony where he queries the epistemological sort of access to knowledge through the I, the first person. Why well, he says, yes, there is a route into creating knowledge, but we always have to be very cautious there because just as much as our emotions can deceive us, which is Nussbaum's point, there is also how do we actually in memorizing or remembering our experiences that is actually a truthful reconstruction of the past. So just some, some you know, there, there are reasons why people don't put eyes on their titles. Yeah. Um, there's a lot, yes, go on. Is it Bill? I can't see. It. The back? Okay. okay. Is it Jeff? <laughs> when you finish, Jeff, I just want to... Okay, look. I could go on literally for an hour responding to that because I think those are so superb, those questions. But let me just very quickly respond to this point about making uh, generalised uh, responses in a conclusion. Now, one of the difficulties here is this, that when I was being taught by uh, the philosophers of the British Analytic School, that what they did was to remove my eye and the practical principles that I used to explain my educational influences in their belief that educational theory was constituted by the philosophy, psychology, sociology, and history of education. And it was this move into generalizability that Richard Peters, one of the key philosophers of the day, would ask, what ought I to do? Let's explore the implications of what ought I to do. But the I was not a real living I. The I was an abstract concept, person. And explicitly, they believed that my practical principles, the principles I'm expressing now, and everybody here expressed in the presentations, now, quote, were at best pragmatic maxims having a loose and superficial justification in practice that would be replaced in any rationally developed theory by the principles from the disciplines of education. Now, am I making sense there? That the whole process of generalizability was actually to enable the teacher-researcher to conform their language to the theories of the day. You know, if they wish to make some kind of general conclusion, they had to put it within one of the existing theories of the day. Now, this is something you've got to be very careful of in relation to action research. Um, I, I'm not sure about the presentation. Uh, Herman's theory. Did somebody use this theory of personality. Yeah. <laughs> now, actually, this happened in one of the sessions, and it was a really good session. <coughs> However, it was Herman's theory that dominated the analysis. You, am I making sense here? Not, and not the living theory of the researcher. Mm -hmm. That one of the difficulties here, and you've got to be very careful here, is to work out what you're testing. Because my master's degree was in the psychology of education. And I was wanting it to help me improve my practice in the classroom with the kids. But what I found under the influence of my tutors, that I ended up testing the validity of Piagetti and cognitive stage theory and Bloom's taxonomy. Because that was where the psychologists were coming from. They had no interest whatsoever in whether my psychology was helping me to improve the learning of my children. Now, you've got to work out here where your generalizability is going to be placed. Are you going to place it within the traditional theory of the academy? Or are you going to actually do something which is actually not in the traditional sense generalizable and show what it is that you have learned and explain that in your own living theory? Now, on my website, you can see the evidence and Jean's website in particular that ideas have traveled around the world. They're not generalizable in the traditional sense of the theory, but they have actually had some universalizing influence in the way that the ideas have been taken up and acknowledged in the process of the other individual creating their own living theory. So I think that those points that you were raising were really crucially important in terms of um, making sure, in my language, that your own living theories are not subsumed by any other theory. 